Good, good afternoon, Mr. Speaker. I hope the whole House will join me in passing our deepest condolences to the families of the people who died and those injured in the explosion in Leicester. In the constituency of my friend, the member for Leicester West, could we say thank you to all the emergency services and hospital staff who worked to save lives in that terrible situation? Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister emerged from her Chequers Away day to promise a Brexit of ambitious managed divergence. <laughs> Could she tell the country what on earth ambitious managed divergence will mean in practice? Can I, can I first of all say to the Right Honourable Gentleman that I join him and I'm sure the whole House in expressing our condolences to the family and friends of those who lost their lives in the explosion in Leicester and I also agree with him that we should commend the activities and the work of the emergency services who day in and day out do so much to, for all of us but in circumstances like that really showed the, the, the great job that they do in dealing with that, uh, in dealing with that issue. Now, he asks me he asks me about the government's position on the European Union, where it's very simple. Uh, we want to deliver on the road to the British people. That means that we will bring back control of our laws, our borders and our money. Now, of course, that's in direct contrast with the Labour Party's position, who want to be in a customs union, have free movement and pay whatever it takes to the EU. That would mean giving away control of our laws, our borders and our money, and that would be a betrayal of the British people. Mr Speaker, I understand the Prime Minister is going to make a speech about this on Friday, but I hope she will address the concerns of 94 per cent of small and medium-sized businesses who say the government is ignoring their concerns about how we leave the EU. But who does she think might be better at identifying the business opportunities of the future? The Confederation of British Industry, the Engineering Employers Federation and the Institute of Directors or the International Trade Secretary? <laughs> gentleman talks about the views of business and talks about the views of small business. Can I just uh, refer him to what the Federation of Small Businesses has said about our position? The UK small business community sees the potential wins of an independent UK global trade policy. We want trade kept as easy as possible with the EU27. That's our position. Small businesses are pushing to export to new growth areas, the US, English-speaking nations, emerging economies and the Commonwealth. A good trading relationship with the European Union and free trade deals around the rest of the world under an independent sovereign nation. Mr Speaker, the International Trade Secretary says that business organisations and TUC have got it all wrong, yes. that they don't know best how to prosper or grasp opportunities. I just put it gently to her. It might be they've got more of a clue than he has yeah. about the interests of business jobs and living standards. Yeah. Last week, the Health Secretary, and it's wonderful to see him here today, I assume he was speaking on behalf of the government when he said there will be areas and sectors of industry where we agree to align our regulations. He seems to know the answer. So can the Prime Minister enlighten the rest of us as to which sectors of the government wants to remain aligned and which they plan to diverge? Well, first of all, the Right Honourable Gentleman himself has, admit, has uh, said that I'm going to be making a speech on these issues later this, uh, later this week. So he could... Uh, uh, just calm down. I've already, I've, already set out, I've already set out in some detail the position that the government is taking. I will elaborate on that further this week. What we want to ensure is that across a variety of sectors, uh, the good sector, uh, but also looking at issues like financial services, which are such uh, a crucial part of our economy, that we get the relationship that means that we are able to ensure that we can see that trade going across uh, the uh, borders between the United Kingdom and the remaining EU27 members 
members, and that we have no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland, and we're absolutely committed to differing on that. But he talks about he talks about people not having a clue. I'll tell him who hasn't got a clue about business and jobs. That's a Labour Party that wants to borrow 500 billion and bankrupt Britain. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, the endless round of after-dinner speeches by the Prime Minister on Europe doesn't really substitute for negotiations as to what is actually going to result from these negotiations altogether. One of the sectors already suffering very badly is that of health and social care. It is highly reliant, Mr Speaker, on migrant workers. We depend on them for our health and the care of those that need it. Isn't the Prime Minister just a little bit concerned that European Union workers with vital skills are leaving Britain in unprecedented numbers now? As the Right Honourable Gentleman might have noticed from the last set of immigration figures, we actually still see more people coming into the UK from the European Union than are leaving the UK uh, for uh, going back to the European Union. But we do want, we do have a care about the number of nurses and GPs that we have in the NHS. That's why we have set uh, the highest levels of training, uh, numbers of people in training for both nurses and GPs. It's why we've significantly increased the opportunities, not just for people who are coming from the European Union to work in our National Health Service, but actually for those people here in this country who want to work in our NHS to get those training places and do the excellent job that we know they will do for patients in our National Health Service. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, from a government that's cut the nurse training bursary yeah. that doesn't seem to understand it takes eight years to train a doctor yeah. and completely oblivious apparently to the fact that there are a hundred thousand vacancies in the NHS yeah. now I suggest some members get a life and go and visit a hospital yeah. and see and see just how hard just how hard, hard those people work in order to cover for the vacancies that are there. Surely we need to give immediate, real assurance to EU nationals they have a future in this country. Mr Speaker, just three months ago, the Foreign Secretary told the House with regard to Northern Ireland, and I quote, there can be no hard border. That would be unthinkable. That's what he said. Yet, in a leaked letter to the Prime Minister, he wrote, even if a hard border is reintroduced, we would expect to see 95% plus of goods pass. He's shouting at the moment. He's obviously mixing up the border with the Camden-Islington border. <laughs> so, Mr Speaker... Mr Speaker, can the Prime Minister confirm that she will not renege on commitments made in phase one to keep an open border in Ireland? Well, can I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, he actually raised three different issues in that question, so I'll address all of them. He raised the issue of rights for European Union nationals and, of course, part of key part of the December agreement, the December joint report that we agreed with the European Union, was about the rights of EU citizens living here in the United Kingdom and the rights of United Kingdom citizens living in the EU 27. That was an important thing to have agreed uh, uh, at an early stage in the negotiations. We said we'd do it and we did just that. He talks about the number of nurses. Of course, there are now 13,900 more nurses on our wards than there were under Labour. And just, as, just while he's talking about the number of years that it takes to train doctors, he said it takes eight years to train a doctor. Well, if he's worried about the number of doctors there are now, eight years ago it was a Labour government that was deciding the number of doctors that were going to be trained. So we can talk about that. And then... And just finally, because he referred to the position on Northern Ireland, the Foreign Secretary and I uh, are absolutely committed to ensuring that we deliver on no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. That's the position of the UK Government. 
It is the position of the parties in Northern Ireland, it is the position of the Irish Government, and it was what we agreed in the December agreement of that joint report. We are all committed to ensuring there is no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, if that is the case, then why is the Foreign Secretary in private correspondence with the Prime Minister about doing just the opposite of that was agreed in Phase 1? Mr Speaker, this is a government in disarray. Every time, every time the Cabinet meets, all we get is even more bizarre sound bites. Remember when we had Brexit means Brexit? Then we had red, white and blue Brexit, which presumably appealed to the members opposite. Then we had liberal Brexit, and now we have ambitious managed divergence. The government is so divided, the Prime Minister is incapable of delivering a coherent and decisive plan for Brexit. So when is she going to put the country's interests before the outsized egos of her own cabinet? to the right honourable gentleman, my priorities are the priorities of the British people. Yes, we are going to get Brexit right and deliver a good Brexit deal for them, but we are also building the homes that the country needs so people can earn their own home. We are raising standards in our schools so our kids all get a good education. We are protecting the environment for future generations. That is a Conservative government delivering on people's priorities and giving them optimism and hope for the future, as opposed to a Labour Party that would bankrupt Britain, betray voters and drag this country down. Yeah.